Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'll be talking today about ScanOSS, which is a company. It's an open source project. Um, so I'll be talking about the actual open source project we have in GitHub and the software and how to use this software. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about the company as well, who we are, what we do. And I'll be uh, focusing on an actual use case, which is how to use our open source, free and open source, to solve a problem. I'm assuming that you're here in the automotive uh, industry. This is the automotive track. And the problem we solve with the uh, free and open source is to make a knowledge base with GPL3 code that then we scan in production to avoid this GPL3 code being in the code base. So just one example for the, of the many, many use cases that you can uh, solve with having your own knowledge base. Today, integrating open source is an involuntary process with latest technologies, uh, AI-assisted tools, and uh, package managers, and, and latest IDEs. The process of bringing open source into the company code is involuntary and invisible. And this is a big problem because this is a, a recent uh, paper published by a company, um, a university in the United States, that says that between 0 0.88 and 2.01% uh, of the code made or generated by AI is strikingly similar to existing open source, as they say. But this is a big problem, because who is not using today AI, right? And it's not just compliance, license compliance. There are many other problems or risks that you can uh, prevent, that you have to mitigate in a company when bringing open source. I'm uh, not talking about open source being risky. Anything that you bring from outside into the company, you're assuming liabilities and you need to be responsible for. So with 90% of open source today, uh, you really have to get a grip on your software composition to mitigate uh, not just license compliance, but also vulnerabilities. You cannot really protect or comply with what you cannot see. So not knowing which open source you use means you're not really going to monitor for the vulnerabilities. Maybe your export control, this is straight compliance, uh, ECCN classification number will not be accurate if you don't really know the complete list of open source. And the list goes on in export control, which is knowing your cryptographic composition now solves another issue, which is security compliance. Because of quantum computing, there are standards, the CAVP by NIST, cryptographic algorithm validation program, is becoming quite topical these days. And it boils down to the same thing. Where, where is my cryptography coming from? Uh, well, from the open source. It's, and it's maybe more than 90%, because rule number one in cryptography is do not make your own cryptography, right? So you mo most likely everything comes from the open source. And we, uh, as a company, we disrupt this market, which has been dominated by proprietary tools. Companies helping companies identify open source for 20 years or more have been proprietary software suppliers. And uh, th this is like we, we say in, in English, there is a saying, the shoemaker's son always goes barefoot. Uh, right? I mean, this, the irony of doing something for a living and uh, not really using it for your own benefit. And this is actually what happened with the SEA uh, business. We are entirely open source, and with that we solve uh, an issue which is big in the industry, which is the vendor locking mechanism. When you make software proprietary and you sell licenses, you want to make it as difficult as possible for the customer to change to the next product which means you're imposing limitations. And if you are familiar with these tools, you know how difficult it is to get all those long years of making identifications into basically a black box, which is difficult to, to extract. We solve that issue. When you make identifications, anything you do, you do it in JSON files or YAML files that are part of your revision history. And that code, you can use it in any other project in the future. And that is also something that drives standardization. 
if you are doing things in an open way, then people will uh, uh, use it, and then you will at some point become a de facto standard. Um, we sell a data subscription. We are not the software supplier, we're a data supplier. So this massive knowledge base, what we have with open source, is what people need to uh, consume to get the identifications done. So we end the per seat cost. If you are familiar with how, diff how expensive it is to have this kind of tooling, you, you will relate to this as a big benefit. And uh, also puts an end to the security concerns, because when you're letting someone handle your source code for auditing, especially when it comes to compliance, it's very sensitive. So you, you put trust on your supplier. In, in our case, you don't have to trust what I'm saying. It's an open source tool, so you know exactly how is it treating your code. And you know that, in fact, it's actually getting fingerprints, and you, you can see all this. By being open source, by definition, you have transparency on how the software acts. And then when it comes to uh, automation, you know, these this proprietary tools started as auditing UIs. So from an auditing application with a uh, UI to getting the ability to integrate them and automate them, it was difficult. And of course, now they are there. Now all these uh, uh, proprietary tools offer you an API for you to, uh, to automate uh, compliance but, or, or security scanning. But in our case, since what we sell is a data set, is this database, we are, by definition, an API which is in front of this database. And therefore, we are built from the bottom up for being automated. And that's what we are, uh, what we uh, excel at. So we have um, the API, of course, is REST and uh, gRPC based on open API and protobuf. Um, and uh, we have built SDKs in different programming languages to facilitate integration to, to customers' applications. And since we have the SDKs, we say, well, we built CLIs on top of those SDKs as, a, as an easy use case. The Python CLI is the one that is uh, uh, mostly used. Um, the scanning that we make is, um, is uh, language agnostic, so it doesn't mean that if you use the Python CLI, it's not just to detect Python code, you can detect any programming language, and the same with the, with the rest. Then we have pipeline integration solutions um, for different technologies. We have webhooks, uh, pre-commit hooks also uh, ready. VS Code integration, IDE integration, there are some others. Uh, we have our own UI, so there's many ways in the development process to, to tap into uh, our knowledge base to solve different problems. Of course, we use SPDX and CycloneDX, and we support legacy SPDX as well, which is important in the automotive industry. And anything that is not SBOM related, which is like a file level information or snippet level information or declaring uh, stuff or configuration. Everything is JSON files or CSV files or HTML files. And we use package URL as the main uh, component identifier and CPE as well, whenever there are vulnerabilities. Now this knowledge base, just to give you some numbers, um, the knowledge base is huge. We downloaded over 250 million open source URLs, meaning component versions. And that expands to 100 million open source files and 3 trillion lines of code. So this is astronomic numbers. When, I, when you see these numbers in the console, you go 3, 6, 12. I mean, it, it, you have to, <laughs> there is no way for us to, to, to perceive the amount of information in our brain. It's, it's just astronomic numbers. And yet, you can run an entire uh, software stack with the um, database using commodity hardware. Now, all the open source we make, these CLIs and, and uh, UIs, everything points by default to the free API, free as in free beer. That free API is provided by the Software Transparency Foundation. We launched this foundation a couple of years ago with the purpose of disengaging the free offering from the company. If I, as a company, provide a free API, then in this open source I make depends on that API, it will not really get a lot of adoption. Com the people will wonder how long would it take for me to shut it down and start charge charging a ridiculous price. So we wanted to disengage this. And now the foundation has companies and universities that are uh, supporting the foundation and supporting this free service. So 
if you download any um, uh, CLI or any, any software from our repositories, it will point by default to osskb.org slash API. If you, if you hit the osskb.org from your browser, you'll see a breakdown of all the millions of URLs, where they come from, and you can download so software and stuff. Now, if you wish instead to have a guaranteed uh, service, guaranteed throughput, guaranteed availability, then uh, you can hire uh, a paid API from ScanOSS, which could be um, SaaS or could be on-premise. Most of our customers prefer on-premise. Most of our customers are large corporations who have internal security requirements of having this kind of tooling on-prem. Or you can make your own UI. You, you can make your own UI for a specific use case, which is one uh, use case I'll be showing here, which is scanning against GPL3 code. And then you point to your local host or whatever machine you have in your, in your network. Now, building this open source knowledge base, the big knowledge base with everything, the commercial knowledge base that we offer, is not an easy. You can, you can do it. You can do it with our tooling, but it involves downloading these million URLs and you uh, find a lot of, a lot of issues. It, it, creating the knowledge base is expensive. Uh, and then maintaining it, updated. Every second, we have dozens of open source component versions being published as we speak now. So keeping it updated is extremely, extremely difficult. And that is what we do for a living. It requires a dedicated team of uh, data scientists and, and engineers and also a team of curators because not everything can be automated and there are things that require human curation. And then once you have that database and you have it updated, then comes the time to provide a reliable service at scale and that is also expensive. So I just wanted to to, to bring this up to, to your attention. Now, if you want to build, build your own knowledge base, saying, okay, I want to have a subset of components for a specific purpose, or another use case, which is uh, what, what some of our customers do, is to make a knowledge base with their proprietary code so that they can prevent IP leakage when releasing open source. So in the policies, you're going to release some open source, that has to be scanned against this host, which contains the internal uh, knowledge base with proprietary code. Um, so if you want to build it, you can do this with 100% open, free and open source software. Our software is released under MIT and GPL2 uh, licenses. Um, and of course, open API, and it's already supported by many other open source uh, tools like Fosology, ORT, uh, Foslight. Uh, these tools like Fosology, ORT, and Foslight, they make detection of what is declared as of dependencies or maybe license files and license headers. Now all these tools integrate natively with ScanOSS. Fosology, for example, now can tell you the license of a file that does not have a license header. Or it could identify a, um, a stack overflow snippet in your code. You can do that with Fosology today. So time for the, the demo. Uh, basically, the demo, the, the focus is to create a knowledge base. So I'll show you how to create a knowledge base. And the idea is you create a knowledge base with GPL3 code. If it, this is the idea is for AGL. In AGL, you, have, you know which components you don't want to have. You have the component versions. So given the input as component versions, you can create your own knowledge base and then scan against this to detect GPL code. So this is a problem you can solve just by using our free and open source and not having to depend on anybody's service. So that's the, the use case. The scanning should be automated to perform at scale. Of course, you want to automate this from a CI CD pipeline. I'll be showing you how to scan from a CLI, but you, know, you can use any, any kind of pipeline in the integration. And uh, you will, of course, reduce cost and risk with having a complete SPOM, meaning you are checking your SPOM against uh, plagiarism. Um, so, and of course, you can do this against the massive knowledge base, but you can also create your, your ad hoc. Uh, KB. So the demo will be, two, we have two parts. I have two videos prepared. One is how to make the knowledge base and another one is to uh, automate this um, 
with uh, an automation. I'm, I'm using here um, GitHub Actions to, to show how that works. So now jumping to the first video, how to make your knowledge base. I have some uh, translations to Japanese done by Claude AI. I asked to be precise on the technical uh, terminology. I didn't have time to check it, so I really apologize. If you see any errors, please let me know. So making your own knowledge base. Uh, our tool is called Miner. Miner is the tool that we use in production to mine. And it's in GitHub. It's a scan OSS uh, slash miner. You can see all the information on how to install it, the dependencies, and so on. Miner takes two inputs. One is metadata on the project, is to know what is the name of it and the version, the, the package URL, and a, a license, if there is a license declared at component level, then it will do detection on the, on the files and so on. And then the actual URL, where to download it from. You can also, if you're making a, a, proprietary, um, a proprietary database, then you can point Miner to a directory if you don't have a download URL. So here is Miner, where you pass the data, minus D. It's a CSV with the, with the main information about what you're about to scan, which you get usually from the, um, from the API when, you, when you're uh, downloading, and then uh, the URL. And that, that's all there is to it. You just hit enter, and this is written entirely in C. The idea is that this has to be really fast. When you do something uh, a zillion times, <laughs> you know, whatever time it takes, multiplied by a zillion, it will be uh, a lot of time. So we, are, we optimize this application to be as fast as possible at doing this, which is downloading and generating metadata. When in this case, it's a small component, and he, here I'm not downloading, I'm just downloading a, a, our webhook just to, to, to show how it works. Um, a directory called mind is generated in the, in the directory. You can also specify the, the, the directory in the command line that contains um, the metadata that was generated. The output of miner is mainly CSV files, and they're also you can see there the, the attribution CSV, copyright CSV, cryptography. If you look at the file, for example, file contains the file names and file hashes and the hash of the actual URL that contains that file. These are CSV files. Why do we use CSV files? Because you, we need to concatenate. Think about this. I just run this once. We're going to have to run this against a thousand or a million components. So you want to have sometimes different instances from different machines. And the thing with the CSV is you can concatenate. I mean, well, after you're done, Miner can actually take a number of sessions and you can concatenate this uh, data. So this um, is going to show now the sources. Sources contains a unique copy of every open source, of every uh, source code file that was generated. And that is zipped in a structure that this MZ extension is not zip files. You cannot concatenate zip files because you break them. But this is sort of zip files that you can concatenate. So again, think about this running at scale in a number of instances, and then you're just adding all the information together. So these MZ files contain the actual source code which, from which we extract the um, snippet fingerprints from here. So the process is called, uh, I just ran it before, is minus Z. And then you see now the WFP is, um, in this case, we don't use CSV files because it's the hash of the file and the, ha the hash of the snippet and the hash of the file. Uh, you know, I mean, if you do that in CSV files, it's twice the, the size. So we go binary. Still, you can concatenate these files, the same as you do with the CSVs. And that is how you generate the snippet. Why do we want to do this in a second phase? The, because then you might want to gather a hundred or a thousand or a million instances, and then from that output you generate the snippet. It saves a lot of time than doing it um, every time. So think about a mining tool that's been built to run at scale. 
Now, once we have the database, and by the way, there is one step that I just realized today that we skipped is once you have all this structure aggregated, then you import that with a simple command, which is ldb minus import, and then the directory, the mine directory, and that imports that into the actual ldb, which is the, the knowledge base. Having a knowledge base, uh, again, ldb stands for LinkedIn linked list database, and it's a data uh, format. Um, it's also open source, and it's also in our, in our uh, GitHub repo. Now, to, for this to run, you have the knowledge base, you need the LDB engine, the scanning engine, and the API. And to make it easy, we have a, a, container, a containerized uh, version of the platform ready. You can download it directly, and you can just do Docker. <coughs> uh, um, and here is how to build it, and, and so on. Uh, so having that, then now we have a host responding, I mean an API uh, instance running and now we can scan. To scan, we need a CLI. Well, in this case, we, 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 I'll show you the CLI, but then we'll do the GitHub Actions integration. So the Python CLI is the most popular uh, CLI, and you find it there. <clears throat> you can also install it with uh, pip3 install scan OSS. And now, so, Assuming that we have created an AGL uh, uh, specific database with GPL code, we'll scan against that. So you do scan OSS PI, scan, you define the API URL. If you don't define the API URL, it's going to scan against the big knowledge base provided by the foundation. But in this case, we're going to point it to the container um, API, specify the endpoint, and the directory that we want to scan. And that it fingerprints and then it sends to the API and gets all the results. So that's how you get all this data in a JSON array. You can specify if you want directly a, a, an SPDX or Cyclone DX uh, output, but if you want to see the actual raw information with details on latching, matching lines and, and so on, then you can just use the standard <coughs> default uh, format. There is cryptography information and a bunch of other stuff. So, okay, speed this up. This is all as far as creating the, um, uh, the knowledge base. Follow us on GitHub, we have a GitHub page. We have, if, you, if you look at our uh, GitHub page, it's uh, lots of components. You can see you don't, we don't have that many followers, but the followers are uh, people from large companies. I mean, we don't sell pizza, right? This is not something that end users will, will find a use for. But it really helps when, when you follow us in GitHub. So if you haven't done that, we'll appreciate that. That really helps. Now, I'll jump now to the GPL3 policy, how to actually do this from um, GitHub Actions, which is an integration that we already have. It's also there. So now, first, we start by adding a file to our repo that contains uh, GPL3 code. So we upload the file. We had to blur that because whoever did the demo there was some customer information there. So I say, this is beautiful, but I'm going to have to blur that part. Uh, so here we say we add a source file. Good. So now we go to the Actions tab, and we see it's the running. And now the policy fails. So you click on the failure. You can see that 100% GPL3 code was found. There is not much more detail here. It's, it's a, it's a high-level license information, what we have in the, in the default integration. But you can jump into the lightweight UI that you run in your, in your computer, and then you can see the code comparison. You can see the typical left and right uh, side of the screen with the actual component. You can click on it, and then you go to the GitHub, and you see what is it that you have added. You can see there a GPL3 uh, component. All right. So that is pretty much the 
demo on how to create your own knowledge base and how to scan against it using a CLI or using GitHub Actions, and there's many, many other options to, to do that. Is there any questions from anyone on this? No questions at all? If there are no questions, we have a little bit more time. I want to show you another way of scanning against the knowledge base, which could be any knowledge base, your knowledge base, free knowledge base, paid knowledge base, knowledge base which is the pre-commit hook. Here we have, I have to pause this video so a little bit fast. Uh, we have a commit already there that contains a file and a snippet. Actually, it's two files, but one file contains an, an uh, untouched community file, and the other one contains an open source snippet. So we attempt a git commit with a message saying adding an open source file and snippet. So the developer knows exactly that's <laughs> doing the wrong thing. And here, the uh, pre-commit hook kicks a scan. The scan finds open source. And then it tells you here that you can run the scan OSS light UI in the terminal to view the match in more detail. We don't, we haven't, if you look in your repos, we don't have the scan OSS lightweight UI published yet. In, it's still a private repo because we haven't decided the name for it. I mean, it, this is recent, I mean, it's been developed a, a couple of weeks ago. As soon as we decide the name for it, <laughs> if anyone has any, any um, suggestion we, we will be happy to hear. So here the lightweight UI shows that there are two files, right? This is the files I have to commit, the, the file and the snippet. What we're doing now is we're accepting the file, we're accepting the component that the file matches as the whole component. So we can accept the file or a component. We take the file and you can have comments or not. We say we choose not to have any, any comments. So we take Spring Boot as an accepted open source component. Now, the snippet, which is pending, we just dismiss it. And I think we say that this is just, uh, this, we dismiss the file. So this file will never bother you again. We say this is public domain code or whatever it is. So you confirm. Now, you save the changes, and that actually creates or adds to the existing scanOSS.json file. So th these decisions, which up until now, for 20 years, have been locked into black boxes, now you have it in your code. So decisions or compliance are part of your repo or part of your revision history. So you have all this uh, traceability in the future. So now we repeat the commit and the commit passes. When it finds the open source, it finds the scan OSS JSON, so it passes. Now if we do, uh, here you can see the two files and the scan OSS the JSON that contains the, the definitions made. So now we're going to try to add another file, to, which is a spring, another Spring Boot file, but the Spring Boot component has been accepted. So we do git add, and now we attempt a commit. This should fail if you didn't have an approval already for that component. In this case, it triggers a scan, and it passes. So that's pretty much this, this uh, demo. There isn't much more but it tells you how to do this at pre-commit. When you have a CI-CD integration, you really want to have a pre-commit hook. Developers will want to have it, because then you can catch the problem before it actually gets to your, um, to, to your pull request. There is no visibility. The, the developer fixed the problem. Sometimes they say, oh, I copied this from, from Stack Overflow. I have to do it. And then they fix the problem. It's not accepting it or ignoring it. You just fix the problem, and then you send the uh, the commit. So, having said that, I think I don't have any. Is there any questions on this? Then we finish uh, ahead of time. No questions? One question. The mic works. Um, in the part of building the knowledge base, how flexible it is on accepting source code? I mean, you uh, like. Uh, the example you gave is like you like a um, company give, puts his own source code and mm -hmm. then you can use it to see if code you are outsourcing to a, an open source project yeah. is being leaked the, the code that yes. you don't want. Okay. Mm -hmm. But um, can you give more like 
I don't know, like binaries, hashes or something. Yes. Yeah, you can you, you also. Can scan, I mean, you can create the knowledge base with any kind of files. You, you can have binaries. You can have uh, any kind of content. You can manipulate minor to tell it to include. Usually, things like, for example, MP3 files, doc, do, uh, documents, and Excel sheets, and anything that is not code by default is ignored. Uh, we, when we mine, we keep everything at file level. We just don't worry about getting into the snippet level. And you know, snippet level is just for uh, source code files. But then, binary files are kept and recognized by the actual hash. So that file structure that I showed, all these CSVs, will contain information on any binaries that you find in that directory. So yes, you, you can match your own uh, proprietary binaries. OK, thank you very much. No problem. No more questions? OK, we'll conclude the session then. Thank you very much. Thank you.